Hi, friends. Welcome to Encouraged and Equipped. On this podcast, we introduce you to the women of Christ Chapel Bible Church. We share our stories to encourage and equip each other to live out our faith in Jesus. We are so glad you're here. Friends are one of the sweetest parts of our lives. In this episode, we invited Misty Denman, Kristen Hines, and Judy Clark to talk about people they love. We specifically asked them to talk about the genuine friendships they have with people of different faiths. They discuss how they enjoy those relationships, how they live out and share their Christian faith, and even some mistakes they've made. Enjoy their fun conversation. My name is Misty Denman, and I'm here with my friends Kristen Hines and Judy Clark. I've been looking forward to having this conversation with the two of you specifically because I both like and respect both of you so much, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say about our topic today because we are going to talk about friendships today and specifically friendships with women in our lives who are either not professing Christians or maybe they are believers but aren't walking with the Lord right now. And I think these friendships are worth taking a close look at because Jesus calls us to be salt and light in the world, and we can't be salt or light if we don't have relationships with women who are outside of the faith. But I do think they can require an extra dose of wisdom and discernment, something you both have a lot of, so I can't wait to ask you some questions about this. So I um, want to know first, what has caused you to make intentional choices in your life to be friends with women who are outside of the faith? Judy, can we start with you? Sure. I feel like I am friends with people from every aspect of life because people are interesting to me, honestly. Like, I like to know what people think, what their background is, where they come from, why they do the things they do. Like, I really find people interesting. And one of the things for me, um, being a nurse, is that going into patients' room, you never really know what you're walking into. And I've taken care of patients who were gangbangers, um, multimillionaires, uh, every, every variety of life. And it's interesting to me. So it's not that I have made an intentional choice. It's that I really am curious about people and like to know what makes them tick. I love that mm-hmm. because it's like you see um, how every person is created in the image of God and, you know, some aspect of God's glory and all people. And uh, I... I like that because I think it it eliminates the categories we sometimes put people in as far as oh I don't know these are these these are the kinds of people I want to pursue and have relationships with and these are not that's a great and thought. I've learned things from non-believers yeah probably as much as I have from believers mm-hmm. I have friends that are not believers who have better marriages who are more generous who might be more moral. I mean, I really don't think the only people I can learn from and emulate are believers. Yeah. So I don't care what religion you're from or what your background is. I I value the things that I can learn from those people. That's a beautiful thought. I love that. What about you, Kristen? What are your thoughts there? Well, I will be honest up front. This is actually something I've struggled with a lot. I have worked at a church for at this church for almost yeah. 18 years. And so meeting people who are have no connection to the church at all is hard. Yeah. But it is something that I think is very valuable and worth pursuing. Um, I think about, you know, as with most things, Jesus being our model of this. And mm-hmm. Jesus mm-hmm. was constantly reaching out to people who— um, maybe weren't following him, inviting them to come along, um, interacting with them, uh, even thinking about Judas, you know, was part of his most inner circle, and he knew Judas was going to betray him, but he still kept him close. He mm. washed his feet, you know, even on that night. So I think, you know, we follow Jesus, and we do like he did, and we reach out to people of not just the people of our own faith, but all kinds of people. I love that. And one of the reasons I want to back up and say one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation with the two of you is because, Kristen, you do work in 
so-called professional, I mean, it is professional full-time <laughs> ministry. So in some ways, people come to you a little more easily. And so you're going to have sort of one group of people in some ways that um, you find it easier to pursue. And Judy, I know you come out of a full-time vocational ministry background, but are working now um, and as a nurse and so or have worked as a nurse. And so you probably more naturally get to be around on a day-to-day basis um, people who you don't necessarily know their faith background. And so I thought it was going to be fun to have the conversation with the two of you who kind of come from, at least at this point in your lives, at uh, different different places, because I think we can all find ourselves at different places in mm-hmm. our life, you know, in different seasons of our life where we are more naturally around people who are walking um, pretty faithfully with the Lord and then at other seasons in our lives or places in our lives, people who aren't. So I think it's fun to get to have both of your perspectives on all of that. So I'd love to know how you have built your friendships. Uh, I mean, building friendships in general is not always easy, but I think (laughs) sometimes it adds an extra layer of um, maybe having to be intentional or thinking about how do I develop and build my relationships with those who um, maybe aren't in the same place spiritually that I am. Um, I just think it requires a different sort of intentionality kind of. Kristen, would you mind sharing your thoughts about that first with us? Yeah. Some of these relationships are actually ones that maybe started here Mm. um, at church that I met through ministry or something like that. But then, you know, maybe some of those people have changed Mm -hmm. their thoughts about beliefs that Mm -hmm. we used to share in common, and maybe they have left the church. Um, But I have been able to still maintain those friendships, just, you know, keep up with them, keep reaching out, keep doing things with them, um, showing them that I still love them either way. Um, And also for people that I've had, you know, no contact with in a church environment, a lot of it is just being present in places. So for instance, there was a coffee shop before it closed years ago that I used to be at so consistently that I knew a lot of the regulars. I knew a lot of the baristas and people there, and we would just have conversations a few days a week, see them regularly, um, sometimes do things outside of that coffee shop. And then even some of them came to family holidays with me. That's awesome. Um, Also, I think just getting involved Um, whether it's a hobby or some kind of a group outside the church or um, serving somewhere outside the church also where you are going to meet people with similar interests. And that's a foundation that you can build on and build a friendship. That is beautiful and great. And I think a great reminder too, because sometimes um, when we find ourselves in those places where your friend friends are only other believers— um, you think, well, I don't, it, where, where do I meet other people? But we all do go to the grocery store, to the coffee shop, to the Sonic, to the whatever. And if you are thoughtful about it, intentional about it, and then I like that idea of just showing up at the same place over and over. That's awesome. I love that. That's great, Kristen. What about you, Judy? Um, for me, so I was in vocational ministry for yeah. 16 years with crew, and it, everything there was intentional. Yeah. It was my job. So um with the girls that were in my Bible study, we would maybe speak in a sorority, and then we'd find the girls that were interested in knowing more about spiritual things. And it was kind of like Kristen. Like, they came to me for that. So it was very overt, mm-hmm. very intentional. You said you want to know more about what it means to be a follower of Christ, mm-hmm. and I could sit down and tell them. And so my friends at that time were non-believers who were coming to me wanting to know more. And then the girls that were in my Bible study, it was helping them grow in that area of evangelism discipleship. Then, after I left crew staff and went into nursing, used my original major, um, I was 40 years old. And at that point, I thought, now, how do I transition from this experience that I've had where I really do know how to share my faith, I know how to talk about my values, I I know how to talk about, you know, my experience. How do I transition and earn the right, basically. That's a great phrase. To have that type of relationship, which is not going to be a 30-minute conversation. It's 12-hour shifts in the middle of the night. So um, I thought about things like that because I didn't know where these people were coming from, my coworkers. And that's my ministry, I would say, with probably more my coworkers than your patients that you just see for a Mm -hmm. day or so. Mm -hmm. 
So little things like when they would call me and say, hey, we're going to be really short tonight. Do you want to work extra? I'd be like, yeah, I'll go in and help the team. Or uh, Christmas parties. I always hosted the Christmas party at my house. I wanted them at my house. I wanted them to see how I live, what I value, um, how to have fun. And so it was things like that that I feel like I really wanted to earn their respect. I needed to be a good nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, I needed to know what I was doing. I needed to be kind, um, not complaining about stuff all the Mm -hmm. time. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I was intentional in earning their respect. And then when opportunities arose, which they did, I might just throw a sentence out. It it wasn't like I was going to sit down and say, I'm going to share the gospel with you, but it would be a sentence. Here's an example. One of my coworkers one day said to me, she was going through something. She's like, Judy, will you pray for me? I said, sure, but wait, you're a Hindu. And she said, (laughs) I know, we believe in a whole bunch of gods and Jesus is one of them. And I said, cool, I'll yeah, sure, I'll pray for you. But, you know, Jesus did say he wanted to be the only one. And she's like, okay, whatever, but please pray for me. I said, okay. Now, in that situation, she asked me to pray for her. I did pray for her. And I threw out one little sentence yes. of theology of Jesus kind of said he wants to be the only one. And that was it. I dropped yeah. it. I'm not going to like sit there right. and try to say, well, here's what Christians believe. And, you yeah. know, but don't that you love point. how she did yeah. that in a really just like, <laughs> yeah. you, you well, spoke I'm spicy. Truth, but it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a little sarcastic and I've got a little sense of humor. So I could throw that out there yeah. and drop it yeah. and pray for her. Exactly. And then when I saw her next time, well, how'd it go? What's yeah. going on? Yeah. So it was little things like that that I thought, how do I translate this quote unquote professional ministry into. Long-term relationships, yes, with all kinds of people, yes. Oh my goodness, I love that so much. Isn't that so like just inspiring? And so it gets you the wheels turning. The other thing is I love about that is we should be good at whatever we do anyway, or at least work really hard at mm-hmm. it, trying to be good and honor or in order to honor the Lord. And so I love that you kind of combine those things that you're. Um, you know that the work you do has value and that also speaks to the world when you're when you're doing those things that speaks to the world about um you know how you honor them let's say you show up on time you're taking those extra shifts or whatever it honors the lord it honors those people and you're you're doing some great things without it having to be this is teaching me a lot about how to um be salt and light without saying I'm being salt and light. I will <laughs> take your extra today. shift. You know, yeah, yeah. So that's really I don't know. It's that's it's great truth. So okay, here's a question for both of you. Um, and Kristen, I'll ask you this first: Is there a place for being a kind, supportive, loving friend to someone who's either not a believer, not walking with the Lord, or do you feel like? Any relationship with a non-believer must include direct evangelism at some point. Yeah, I really think you need both. Uh-huh. I think I think if every single conversation you have with that person is a gospel presentation, I think you might not have many more yes. conversations with them. Yeah. Um, and but, be very boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for real. <laughs> but I think I think you do want to get it in there. I mean, even the little kind of natural ways that come up, like Judy just gave a yeah. great example of, yeah. um, being able to include that. I think um, I was listening to a podcast recently with Christine Kane, and she was talking about how mostly it's Christians who every day think about eternal things, often throughout the day. Mm-hmm. And most non-Christians are focused more on issues kind of here and now, mm-hmm. what's happening in this world. And um, I think we need to be able to talk about those things with them, show that we care about those things. And I think when we care about what they care about, we'll also have opportunities to point out how the gospel affects my thoughts yeah. on those things, yeah. how the gospel gives me hope when these hard things are happening, um, sharing wisdom we get from the Word of God in the topics and situations that interest yeah. them and affect them. Yeah. And you're sort of saying a similar thing to what Judy said. Judy said, um, you know, you want to earn the right to be mm-hmm. heard. And and when you say, I want to care about what they care about, to me, that is yeah. earning the right to be heard, just being and a part of their lives. And it's showing that, you know, this thing that is the most important thing to me actually can speak to the things that are most important to them. That's great. And maybe yeah. it sparks an interest. Yes. Maybe they want to hear more. Yeah. 
yeah, that's mm, that's gold. Gold. I feel like your question was, should all conversations, all relationships always invite in, involve direct evangelism? So now that I teach nursing, I listen to questions better. So the um, the question, should all relationships always know, mm-hmm. um, have direct evangelism? No. However, I do feel like at some point, if somebody's really my friend and I've spent any time with them at all, I want to know what, where they're coming from. I mm-hmm. want to know what they believe in, uh, what they value. And I want them to know that about me too. Just like I want to know, you know, where they went to college or what they like to do on the weekend. It's just um, something that I'm interested in. So yes, I do believe that at some point I will probably, I will definitely want to know that about them and I probably will share that about me. I think it'll be very sad if we were friends for any period of time and they didn't know that about me. I, then I've really not done a good job mm-hmm. in representing Christ. If all they know is my profession or I went to TCU or I have four dogs or whatever it is, yes. I would be really sad if they weren't if they were asked to describe me and they didn't say, "Oh, she's a Christian." Yeah. Like I kind of want that to be the first thing. Absolutely. A lot of times what people say is, "Oh, she's um outgoing or she talks a lot or she's smart or she's pretty or she's all these things uh-huh. and that's great, but uh-huh. that's not the point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I want people to know that I'm a believer because that really is, like Christian's saying, that really is what you wake up and you think about eternity and what motivates me and what's important today. So yes, I I do believe that as a believer, um, we want people to know that. And I also believe that eventually we come become what we hang around. Mm-hmm. That's so a I need to know where they're coming from and what they value because if they have none of my same values, I'll still love them. Um, I'll still want to be friends with them. But I've got to surround myself with people that think like me, because if not, I'm going to become just, I, I, I'm going to, I should be too old for peer pressure, but I'm not. I'm no, going to become, right. I'm going to become like them yeah. because that wears on me. So whether it's their language or the way they spend money or what their values yeah. or whatever it is, I will end up becoming like them. So yeah. I've got to surround myself with some people that are like me. That's great, mm-hmm. Judy. I know that when I was a young professional right out of college, it was something I struggled with a ton because I was uh, right out of college. I was an elementary school teacher and I had had this great spiritual experience in college and thought there's no way I would never, you know, want to talk about Jesus all the time. But that was when I was surrounded by people that talked about Jesus all the time. Then I became a school teacher surrounded by people who were a lot of fun, but weren't believers at all. And after a couple of years of that, I realized that I had really begun to compartmentalize my life and sort of was one person uh, around my Christian friends and another person around my school friends. And it actually took my husband pointing that out. He did it in a kind way, but it was like one of the more convicting moments in my entire life. And ever since then, I've thought, I don't want to be two different people. You might Mm -hmm. have different conversations. You might um, approach things differently. You might have different discernment about what you choose to say and when you choose to say it. But I want to be the same person through and through enough that um, even if we don't talk about my faith a lot, because at this point they're not super interested in it, they would at least be able to identify me that way and know that that's a central um, part of my life, um, even if at that point it's not something that we um, we share or talk about all the time. So yeah, I love the way you said that. So we've I think we've touched several times on this idea of earning the right to be heard, uh, earning the right to bring your faith up, talk about it. Talk to me more about how you've done that, how you do that, just your thoughts on that, because I think it's, uh, I th- I think it's, it, it's one of those places you have a potential to be really, really awkward and off-putting or really, really warm and inviting that um, does make people think, I want to know how and why she is who she is. So Kristen, what are your thoughts there? I think partly it's, a lot of it comes from the buildup to that, mm. how your relationship has been up until then. If you're, you know, being a good friend and you've shown that you care about them, you're interested in them, you've had fun together, you have good times and um, are there for them when something's hard, there for them when things are happy. Um, when you show 
not with just your words, but with your actions, that you love Beautiful. them and care about them, mm -hmm. then I think they're going to be more willing to at least hear what you have to say and have a conversation about yeah. the Lord and faith, um, what their response is to yeah. that, who knows. But yeah. if they know you love them and you're only talking about this because you love them yeah. and care about them, I think they'll at least be willing to hear. Yeah, I love what you had to say there, Kristen, because I think that is the es the essence of uh, earning the right to be heard. It's just when you love someone well and you're with them in the day to day of life, and um, and and they know that, and they know that you're not a project to them, but it's just an outpouring of you know what you care about and you love them, and um, they hopefully will want to hear what you have to say at that point. I don't know, mm -hmm. Judy. What are your thoughts there? I, I feel like this is uh, may, maybe an area of expertise for you. Ooh, expertise. <laughs> yes. That's not said of me very often. Um, I feel like we are ambassadors for Christ. And mm -hmm. I have never been to the Philippines, but I've worked with a lot of nurses from the Philippines. So they don't know it, but they are like little ambassadors from the Philippines to me. So I don't since I've never been there, I don't have any impression of the Philippines other than what they have shown me. And what I can say about the Philippines is they all are great cooks. I mean, I'm <laughs> telling you, these girls, those potlucks in the middle of the night, those girls can cook. Um, they all work two or three jobs. Um, they have great parties. So my impression of the Philippines are, and they're really smart. They're very smart. They work a lot of jobs. They're great cooks, and they're a lot of fun. So my entire impression of the Philippines is based on about, I don't know, five or six Filipino nurses I've worked with. And in the same vein, I'm an ambassador for Christ. Mm -hmm. So if I know that I'm representing Christ in every interaction, if somebody knows I'm a believer, how I respond to a trial, how I respond to mistreatment, um, everything in my life, people are watching me. So... I have to know that I am representing him all the time. Mm -hmm. I went through a hard time uh, several years ago at a hospital I worked at, and I had the opportunity to respond in a way that someone of the world would and someone of a different kingdom would. Mm -hmm. And I was very intentional in um, this response, knowing that I am representing Christ because I didn't want to burn any bridges to any ministry I'd had. And it was really tough, um, but it, it was inspiring to me. Honestly, when you see yourself do something right, um, not to say I'm like Jesus, but I did think, okay, this is a real opportunity right here to, uh, to respond to this tough situation in a way that honors Christ or mm -hmm. in a way that a normal person would. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I go, like Christian was saying, you wake up in the morning. I wake up in the morning thinking, I'm representing Christ today. I'm an ambassador for Him. People are watching me in every interaction. And that, it's a job. It's a job description. And it's not that I have to do it all on my own power. I mean, you have the Holy Spirit right. to live His fruit through you. But when I have an opportunity to demonstrate love, joy, peace, patience, all the fruit of the Spirit, then I want to be that ambassador. Mm -hmm. I want to be a good reflection. So they can say someday, you know, I, I don't really believe what she believes, but man, she was there for me. Like Kristen said, she was there for me. When I needed something, she was the one who came and helped me. She was the one who responded to me in a loving manner. So that's a, you know that's the least I can do. So, and when you do say, you know, okay, I want to... I wanna talk to you about the gospel or, you know, not that you would phrase it that way, but yeah. when you do have that conversation, they've seen your life. Yeah. And they've seen that this gospel actually affects the way you live and interact with them. And I think that gives it more believability when you talk to them about it. And saying, this was hard. This was a struggle. I wanted to act like this, but I thought, you know what? I believe in something greater than myself, so I'm going to respond like this. So I let them know, mm -hmm. like... It's not natural. It's not easy, but I believe that this is the right thing to do. So I chose to make this decision. So let them in on it. I mean, I don't want them to always see me being That's perfect. That's great. Let them in on <laughs> yeah. your thought process yeah. there. Well, obviously, yeah. I let people in on all my thought yeah. processes because my <laughs> thought processes are out loud. Yeah. But I want them to know it's not easy. Yes. It's, yeah. it's still a struggle yeah. because it's still, you know, my will— 
or choosing to be obedient yes. to God. And I let them see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or I want them to see that. But I love that because if there is an assumption that because you are a Christian, being kind, doing the right thing or whatever comes easy, we all know that's not <laughs> necessarily true. And so the fact that you do sort of process out loud and can say, this isn't easy. I still have the urge to do X, but because um, because of my faith, I'm going to do Y. I love. I, I think that that is really meaningful and well. And our powerful. whole series right now, the upside down yeah. thing in church, is that you know, uh, what do you do to an enemy? We want revenge. We yep. want to be angry. Mm-hmm. We want to. We want to get back at them. But what does God say? Love your enemies. Pray mm-hmm. for them. Dang it. Right. I don't even like you. How am I supposed to love yeah. you and pray for you? But that is where we choose to be obedient. And mm-hmm. that's where when I when somebody knows that I have a quote unquote enemy right. and they say and I'm like I'm really mad at that person but this is crazy but the Bible tells me to love them and pray for them and I'm going to have to do that. As much as I don't like them right now, I'm going to love them and pray for them. So they see that it's not just yeah. pie in the sky some, you know, Flaky little easy yeah. thing. That's so good because right before you mentioned the you know the Matthew series that we're going through uh, in the Beatitudes, I was thinking about how what you just described and the situation at work that you could have responded one way, but you um, responded another way is one of the more Monday morning relevant things that I've heard in a long time because we talk about that you know how we apply. Um, you, you hear from the pulpit on Sunday morning a lot, you know, how do we apply this to our everyday lives? Well, that's it. You just gave an example exactly of how we apply it to a hard situation at work in our lives, whatever. That's that's beautiful. So here's another question. How are the friendships we're talking about today different from your friendships with women whose faith is central to your lives. And Judy, I know you talked about how, hey, I want to be salt and light to the world, but it's also super important to me to surround myself with believers. And I know you'd both feel that way. Just so talk to me about what some differences are there. What is what does that look like for you, Kristen? I think for me the main differences would be um, accountability and advice. So with both sets of friends, we might do a lot of the same things, have a lot of the same fun, you know, those kinds of things. But if I know somebody is not actively following Jesus, then they're not going to have the same thoughts as I do on fighting sin and, you know, just how to make decisions on everything. And so I'm going to go to my believing friends to hold me accountable to fighting that sin and to following Jesus well. Or if I need advice, I know, hopefully, that a Christian is going to give me advice that's based on Scripture, um, and so I'm going to go to them for that. Um, But I still will look for opportunities to ask advice from friends who aren't believers. You know, there are some things where they can still give me wisdom, and I think it will honor those friendships. Yes. Um, everybody to do likes that, but to have— Yeah, to be helpful. Yeah, and everybody to, likes you know, to be helpful. Everybody wants to give advice. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'll look for those opportunities, but I know for my main advice and accountability, I'm going to go to my believing friends. That's so great. I think that's a great way to sum that up, advice and accountability. That's great. What about you, Judy? I agree. Um, I feel like for me, one thing is I'm so much more— um, I hate the term judgmental, but I have different expectations for my Christian friends than I do my non-Christian friends or other religions, yeah, whatever. Yeah. My non-Christian friends, I they're fun. I like them. They're interesting. They might be experts in different categories. That's great. But my Christian friends, I have expectations of them. And th- my expectation is that they are walking with the Lord, I have a totally different standard for my Christian mm-hmm, friends and my mm-hmm. non-Christian friends. So if one, if a person who's not a believer and they're, I don't know, living with their boyfriend, I don't care. I mean, why shouldn't they? <laughs> they don't have the same set of standards right. that I do. So you're not treating somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit like they have the Holy no. Spirit because they don't have the Holy Spirit. If they don't have the Holy yeah. Spirit, yeah, and I'm not the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So I don't expect them to live any differently than they do. But my believing friends, my friends that are believers, I I agree with what you say, going to them for advice on, um, you know, matters that matters of the heart, yes, things that are really important. I, I expect them to um, be there for me on those kind of things. But um, 
I'm just, I'm more judgmental of myself and my Christian friends that we should be walking with the Lord. Now, do we always in every category? Of course not. Yeah. And I'm not going to not be friends with somebody yeah. because we all have those momentary things, but I hope they call me out on it. Yes. You know? Like if they see me do something, say something, call me out on it. Yeah. I'll be defensive. Yeah. I'll, I'll you know, I, I won't like that. But eventually it'll be like, oh, dang it, you're right. You know? So they're not my Holy Spirit. Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit's job mm-hmm. to help us and guide us, but we're all on this team together. So, um, yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, I have been reminded several times when I've been frustrated with um, somebody who isn't a believer expecting them to act like they are. And um, I know I've had people say, hey, why are you expecting them to act like, um, you know, act act in a way that's just not who they are. Love them where they are. Love them for who they are in that moment. And then, you know, hopefully later on down the line. But yeah, that's great truth. That's really good. So I agree with Christian. My With Christian, my Christian friends are those that I know we just have a, a one layer deeper. Yes. Mm-hmm. My non-Christian that's a good way to friend, say that. it's just one more layer. Yep. And that's why I think marriage, you know, people like, obviously working with college students for all those years, a million times, they would start dating a non-Christian. I'd be like, oh, don't do this. You know, the Bible's really explicit on this. And they're like, no, I'll bring him up to my level. No, you won't. It's yeah. never happened. I've never seen him ha- n- never seen it happen. Because you're going to miss, you're going to end up dating this guy, marrying this guy, and there's going to be that one layer of depth that you don't have with an unbeliever. Yeah. And, and it's the most important layer. It's the, it's most, the most important, important layer. Because yeah. it really is the core of who you are yeah, and what you exactly. believe. So that, that's the difference between my non-Christian and Christian friends. Not how much fun you have. Yeah. Because right. honestly, sometimes the Christians are kind of, <laughs> yeah. That's why you said we're so cool, because not all Christians are cool. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you are <laughs> cool, Judy. Yeah. And but it, I think there's great value in knowing how to have fun uh, without sending all over the place. Exactly. You know, like yeah. there's, there, it is. It's fun to know how to, it's good to know how to have fun um, and not regret the fun you had. Uh, and remember it. And remember it. Um, yes. Okay. So... The next thing I want to ask you really, that's a great segue into it, which what you just said, which is how do we kindly or wisely navigate staying true to our faith without coming across as judgmental to our non-believing friends? Because I think that's a hard Mm -hmm. thing to do. I have noticed in my own life, sometimes by my choosing just not to do something, that that feels or comes across as judgmental. And I haven't always known exactly how to talk about that, what to do about that. So I'm, I'm here for your wisdom. What do you think, Kristen? Well, I think, that's, I think it is important to remember that just by existing as Christians in a non-Christian world and living according to God's standard— People are going to have feelings about that. Truth. And they will maybe say those feelings are our fault. You're judging me, Mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we can genuinely not be doing that. Um, So sometimes people's feelings of being judged are not necessarily our fault. It's kind of between them and the Lord. Yes. But you're the conduit for, yes. Um, But sometimes we are very judgmental. (laughs) And we don't want to be. I think— you know, some of it will come down to the ways we maybe talk about the things we do or don't do with them. Um, maybe we go, you know, somewhere with them, but don't drink so that we can drive them around or help make sure they're safe. Or maybe they're doing something that we don't want to do because of our faith, but we can say, oh, I'm busy or I just can't go that night. Yeah. We don't have to turn it into, well, you're doing this thing that is a sin and you're a sinner and I'm not going to be a sinner, so I'm not going with yeah. you. you know? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that would yeah. not be helpful. Um, I think it's also helpful to not be shocked when, you know, like we've talked about, when non-Christians don't act like Christians. Don't be shocked, yeah. you know, if somebody's using language that I wouldn't use or doing things that I wouldn't do, why would I expect them to do it, like we said, if they don't have the Holy Spirit? So um, I like to try to think of it as, wow, you know, they're sharing this part of their lives with me, and they know I 
don't do those things or disagree with those things, but they trust me and trust the love I have for them to share that with me and trust our friendship. And I still get to be part of their lives. I think that's really a blessing. That's really good. That's really great. Because then you've really earned it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that you really have earned their respect. Yeah. So that's great. I feel like for me, I don't care if you're a Christian or not a Christian. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I kind of would like to be the Holy Spirit sometimes, (laughs) but I'm not the Holy Spirit. That's not my responsibility in your life to point out your quote-unquote sin. You know, it's the log spec thing that we heard about, again, Mm -hmm. in church. It's Mm -hmm. like, uh, don't be pointing out the speck in your eye when I have a log of my own. So I feel like if I continually remind myself that is not my responsibility— um, now, does that mean I never point it out? N- no. I mean, I might say, you're, you're doing things that are damaging to you. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's not, you weren't designed for that. That's damaging. I don't, it doesn't matter what the category is. Um, I might say something like that. But then you drop it because then it's the Holy Spirit's job to, if they're a believer, to convict them. If they're an unbeliever, to draw them, draw that person towards the Lord and I, I just have to I have to drop it. But with believers, I feel like, you know, we're on this um, team sport. So let's say we're training for the Olympics and, you know, we're on this kingdom team and I want us all to be given 100%. Like if I'm in it to win it and you're kind of flaking out, then you're hurting me and you're hurting our whole team. So I might say, hey, man, you know, come on, let's, you got to get it together. Um, but I want them to say that to me too. So I feel like it's kind of like what you were talking about earlier about accountability, Kristen. Like we need to hold each other accountable, but I, I don't need you every day pecking on my shoulder telling me, you know, <laughs> what, what I need to do differently. And I'm not going to do that to you either. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it is a really delicate balance. It is. It is. It requires that wisdom and discernment, and that's what the Holy Spirit gives us. And um, okay, so let me ask you this. How do you, when you're in that kind of situation uh, with... Let's talk about with our, since this is kind of the main topic, with our friends who aren't believers, how do you make that decision? How do you figure out, I've said what I need to say, now I'm going to close my mouth. What, what's your decision-making process there? I wish it was good. <laughs> um, I, I would say that one of the things, I, I use humor a lot uh-huh. um, to, to diffuse things. Yeah. Um, the other thing is probably to ask questions. Mm. Because honestly, I do think when people, when you're living contrary to the way God designed you, believe it or not, um, you are miserable. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're a believer and you're not walking with God, making really bad decisions, you are miserable. And I think even unbelievers, whatever their situation is, they're inside, if they're honest with themselves, they're pretty miserable. So asking questions, because honestly, people will bring themselves to that place mm-hmm. eventually. So the Holy Spirit, their own internal voice, whatever it is, yeah. will bring them to that place of, you know what, this isn't working for me. You know? This guy's horrible. I need to get away from him. Or you know what? I am in so much debt. I'm in so much trouble with money. I need to fix this. So yeah. even I think non-believers, if you ask them questions, sincerely listen, maybe not give all the advice, which I'm horrible at, because I do want to fix you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in a perfect world, that. I get that. Yeah. In a perfect world, l- let them kind of come to their own conclusions because I think people are smart enough on their own to do That's that. That's great. Yeah. I have often uh, prayed, Lord, would you open my mouth if it needs to be opened and close my mouth if it needs mm-hmm. to be closed? I have to pray that. So so much. Okay, write I have that a, down. I need to. I yeah, need to do because that. I have a tendency to open my mouth a lot yeah. more than I, I fix it. should. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, you know, on the other side, there are times when I have known that the Holy Spirit was prompting me to speak a truth in love that I haven't wanted to out of fear for how it would be taken. So that's one of my more constant, more constant prayers: is give me the. Uh, courage to say what I need to say, and also the, um, I want to say wisdom, but maybe the, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for is, but whatever it takes to clamp my mouth shut when I need to clamp (laughs) my mouth shut and keep it shut. Um, Sometimes I can feel the little muscles on the side of my jaw kind of sore from closing my mouth so tightly, but there's, 
I've, I have all, so much more frequently regretted what I have said, to be honest, mm-hmm. than what I haven't said. So anyway. That's that. a whole other podcast. It is there a whole, are, I was just thinking are, that. We're not going to get off of there that. There are two categories of life, podcast. people that say too much and people that don't say yeah. enough. And yeah. they're both yeah. errors on opposite yeah, ends. exactly. So I just think it requires a lot of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Okay, what about, um, what about mistakes you've made along the way? Because I feel like you've shared a lot of great wisdom. I feel like I have a lot of great takeaways of ways that I can move forward in these relationships in my life. But I'm also curious if looking back at some of these friendships, you think, mm, I would have done that differently if I had it to do again. Um, there's got to be those for sure. Kristen, will you start us out there? Sure. Yeah. I think um, sometimes it actually is. I didn't say this. Mm-hmm. I felt mm-hmm. prompted by the Spirit. I felt like, oh, this, that was my opening. I could have asked a good question. I could have brought up something, and I didn't speak. And usually it comes down to that fear of man. When I gave in to fear of man instead of fear of the Lord and for my really, not even for them because I thought it would make them uncomfortable or it would make them feel bad in some way, but really it was about me and my comfort. It would have been uncomfortable for me to say something hard or to start that conversation. And I chose myself and my own comfort over having an eternal conversation, yeah. an important eternal conversation with someone that I love, but I loved myself more. Yeah. Ooh, that is convicting and well said. Yeah, it yeah. stinks. It does. Okay, so then how do you go back and fix that or do it differently next time? Um, I think once you feel how bad it feels to not do it, I think the next time that the opportunity comes up, Mm -hmm. it makes it a little easier to say, okay, this is uncomfortable, but what was worse was when I felt convicted that I disobeyed the Lord, so I'm going to do it. And I think sometimes you can go back to that person and even say, hey, remember when we were talking about whatever, you know, I really wanted to say something, but I didn't. Um, but I want to say it now. That's you know, good. you just kind of revisit it and yeah. bring it back up. If you have a relationship yeah. and a good friendship like we've been talking about, hopefully that's an opportunity. That's really good. I love that. I love that. What about you, Judy? I think it is I totally agree. And I think sometimes we say too much, sometimes we don't say anything. And either way, it's who we are, what we did at that moment, and we have to again trust God. It really is ultimately his job. It's not my job to save the world. Um, It is his and how I responded or didn't respond or what I said or didn't say. If you can fix it, like I love your sentence of saying, hey, you know, I should have said this in that time and I didn't. I want to tell you this now. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's genius. But also giving yourself the grace of, you know what, I am not the only person that this person will ever run into that knows the Lord. And if I blew it, I blew it. Mm-hmm. God, it's your job. <laughs> you, you will draw them to yourself. So do your thing. But next time, I want to be obedient, or I want to not say that, or I want to you know, be more overt or whatever it is, and not being so hypercritical of ourselves. Mm-hmm. We've got to give ourselves grace. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, if the disciples who hung out with him the whole time, if they could mess up, then give myself some grace. That's great. So how many opportunities have I missed? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. M- hundreds, millions. Who yeah. knows what I've missed? How many have I taken that were there? I don't know. Yeah. But God, use me today. Wake me up. Do what you want to do with me today. And if, if I do a good job, great. If not, we start over tomorrow. Right. And that's what grace is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why his mercies are new do, every morning. I love know? it. Yeah. That's really good. So do I know the mistakes I've made? No. I'm sure many, many. Yeah. But is God powerful enough to... Yeah. It's his problem. To, to, <laughs> I mean, yeah. To bring somebody to himself, draw yeah. somebody to himself that he wants to. Yes, it's he not is. All about me. us. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you said, Judy, like, we're not their Holy Spirit. And also, like, my disobedient moment isn't powerful enough to ruin God's plan. Exactly. Absolutely. You, you're He's not gonna still keep, got it. You're yeah. not going to keep him out of the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that that reminds me, too, of one of the things that I don't think we've, we've uh, talked about a ton here, but 
I've got to pray a lot in these relationships. One, because I know the weakness in my own heart is really not about them. I mean, like, obviously I have people that I'm praying for that I want to, to know the Lord who don't right now. But even more than that, I feel like I have to pray for my own heart because I know my own weaknesses and my own tendency to real easily be drawn into sin and real easily be drawn into, um, I don't know, really poor ways of thinking. And so I pray for my own heart a lot mm-hmm. that um, I would be true to the Lord and uh, that He would be honored in what I say and do, no matter what crowd, whatever um, group I'm in. Uh, yeah, I think I spend far more time praying for myself than I do for the people that uh, maybe don't know Him, and that has not steered me wrong. Um, yeah, so I, I think we 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 pray all the way around, but that's what I have had to learn, particularly in those early years of kind of starting to categorize my life when I shouldn't have into my believing friends and not believing friends. Is man, pray for yourself. It's like that log in your own eye, right? Yeah, um, yeah. pray for yourself in your own heart. Make me of, a good witness. Make yes. me a good ambassador. Make allow me to reflect you today. Mm-hmm. Um, al- allow the fruit of the Spirit to be demonstrated in me. Yes. I want people to see that, yeah. but I have to ask for that. Yes, mm-hmm. that's a great That's a great thought. Any any last thought, Judy? Any Anything you want to add before we're done? I, I would just say one of the things that has been a delight for me, and that's part of not being in full-time Christian work, is that I've had the opportunity to, to be friends with people probably... I would say probably every spiritual background. Mm. Maybe I don't have a Wiccan friend. I don't have a Wiccan or a witch friend. But other than that, I've got friends from every spiritual background, and I like learning from them, and I like knowing them and seeing what makes them tick and not being afraid. When you're a baby new brand, brand new believer, you're afraid of anything that's different from you because... Oh, what if it, you know, what if it freaks me out? What if it changes me? I'm not afraid of anything that they have to say mm-hmm. because I know what my faith is rooted in. So for me, I love having friends from different backgrounds and hopefully they like knowing me. Mm-hmm. And they're representing their their religion, mm-hmm. their background, their values mm-hmm. and I'm re- I'm representing mine and you know what? I know our I know our faith is true. Mm-hmm. And so there again, God do your thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to respect them and love them, but God do your thing. And I think that's kind of my um, hope is that my life is a good reflection, that I'm a good ambassador, but ultimately it's God's responsibility to draw somebody toward himself. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great. I couldn't have summarized our discussion <laughs> any better. So I think I'm going to leave it right there because that is a great, those are great summary closing thoughts. And I'm super excited because uh, I think this has kind of motivated me and encouraged me to be a little bit more intentional. There are times when I forget to be intentional uh, in friendships in general, and certainly specifically um, friendships uh, with those who maybe aren't walking with the Lord right now. So this has been a great uh, fire under my feet, I think, to uh, be thinking, be praying, being intentional and going out there and earning the right to be heard. So thanks y'all so much for uh, your thoughts. I um, love both of you, respect both of you, and and I can, uh, this this conversation has reminded me why. So let me pray. Our pleasure. <laughs> Lord, you are so good and great, and I thank you that you give us the gift of relationships, first of all. I thank you that um, even with the disciples, you sent them out together, um, that you it is your intention that we do life together. I pray that you would make us women who are wise, who love others well, who are great ambassadors for your kingdom, and then who are really willing to... Um, admit when we're not and repent and walk back towards that. And there's there's so um uh, there's so much joy, Lord, in uh being yours. I just pray that we would be salt and light to the world and that we would um honor you and um represent you well in this world. And I ask all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.